Okay, we're recording. Hi, everybody. My name is Kevin O'Brien, and this is the Why Our World interview series. In this series of interviews, we are recording our users from all over the world and getting their experiences of being part of the R community globally. Today, we are joined by Dennis, and Dennis is joining us from Nigeria. Hi, Dennis. Hi, Kevin. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Dennis Ray from Nigeria. Uh, I currently work as a data scientist for Predictive Insight, which is based in South Africa. Yeah. Good stuff. Are right, you're actually in Nigeria now? Are you? Or are you in South okay, Africa? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm based in Nigeria, so we're, we're actually working remotely, which is pretty cool and flexible. So, and it's been fun too. Good stuff. Tell me, uh, Nigeria is a, is a very big country. So there's Lagos and Kano. There's a bit, very big Nigerian art community there. Where are you based yourself? Um, so yeah, they're, they're actually, Nigeria is actually very big. So I, I'm currently based in Accra, which is um, a capital of Ondo State. So it's in Southwest of Nigeria. I was like four hours drive to Lagos and about seven hours drive to Abuja. Well, by flight, it's like 50 minutes, um, both to Abuja and Lagos. So yeah, so basically I'm busy in on those days. Um, it's a really small city, um, but I finished from the university here, which is Federal University of Technology, Accra. And after I was done, which is like two years ago, um, I decided to step back, you know, just to gather myself a little bit, you know, gain more experience before I move to the bigger cities, you know, Abuja or Lagos. I'm thinking Abuja though, because it's it's bigger landmass than Lagos. Lagos is crazy. Well, good stuff. I, I love to go and visit Nigeria. Tell me, uh, you uh, recently graduated in the past three or four years. What were you studying in college, in university? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I finished December. Uh, I graduated from college December 2019. Um, and I study meteorology and climate science. Um, so it's actually the only university right now in Nigeria that's studying um, meteorology and climate science. So I, I actually majored in atmospheric sciences. Um, and I, yeah, that's, that's what I studied. That's a very interesting subject. I don't know much about that. Tell us more about that. Uh, particularly from the point of view of technology, data science, statistics, and so on. Because I'm sure it's oh, used okay. in there, but I just don't know much about it. It's very interesting. Oh, yeah, definitely. So basically, um, as a metrologist, uh, basically one of what we do is um, forecasting, weather forecasting. So um, my project, my final project was to monitor air pollution, um, forecasting of air pollution in a particular community in our career using remote sensing. Um, it was actually really interesting because um, we we're looking at quarry sites. Quarry sites are sites that um, they blast rocks and blast um, using different methods like destroy rocks in order to be able to extract it to do um, other, um, other resources like road construction. But the interesting thing about this process is that these sites are really found very close to households, like a lot of houses are built around this place, so which is definitely not good because it causes some um, on pollution, if uh, hazard, so these people are known to them. So part of the study was to understand why do people actually move there or why do people actually locate there? And pretty much it was actually one of the is like lack of information. So they are not really aware that um, high concentration of PM 2.5, it's actually bad to, for them. So some of the effects having them is like they start having some, you know, inhale like inhaling issues like um, kidney issues and liver and stuff, but they're not really aware this is the effect, effect is something else, but it was actually a really nice study. So um, as a meteorologist, that was actually what I studied, but other people could actually focus in weather forecasting, like um, when the rain will fall in this area, when the rain will not fall and, and everything. But the issue with this um, method in Nigeria is because the equipment we have right now is not really as much, so we only have um, a central location that we use to predict the entire um, city, and like, and that, I think that's actually one of our basic biggest limitation here in, in Nigeria when it comes to forecasting. But other than that, the educational system seems really robust. It's like what's going on in, in Europe from what I've seen comparing curriculums, and in the process we're using tools like R. Yeah, that's actually have meant R to do some forecasting as well. So pretty much that's. That's what I studied. And it's actually a five year course because um, you end up with a bachelor in technology, not science, which is pretty cool. 
Excellent. So um, tell me when you started your journey with R, how did you find it? So I take it you started in university. Oh, yes. So at first, um, there's this um, lecturer of mine who introduced me to Fortran. Um, and then after using it for a while, so we started talking and then he made me aware of R. And at first, he just wanted me to understand, like, because he felt I'm actually not using my time judiciously and I was actually focusing on GIS stuff and it was like yeah so maybe if you want to learn this aspect of metrology which is modeling um you should probably you should learn R. Interesting enough at then I actually love computer science like I was spending more time on my laptop learning programming like HTML and CSS and stuff but um but then when when he actually told me about R, at first, I think for the first two years, I wasn't really paying much attention. I just learned the basic, which is you know how to you know, how to declare variables, um, the data types and data structures and, and the likes. So it was, yeah, I think it was it was good. Like it was good. Like you just, uh, but then the interesting thing again was um, the community was not vast. And I, I could say in my set when I was like, I think I was like in my second year or. Yeah, it's my second year when I actually stumbled, it, stumbled into it, but I never actually put more interest. But in my third year, um, I realized that uh, a lot of people in the school wasn't really paying much attention to R because um, they are actually talking about Python, they're talking about learning Java, learning C Sharp. I actually spent some time learning C Sharp as well, but I think I spent like a few months just testing it. It was really nice. But for, for R, it's only much people learning about it. And it was like, I was alone in it. At first, I felt it was a problem, right? Um, but then at the same time, it actually inspired me to like, you know, so since no one is actually looking here, maybe you could actually change this area a little bit. And, and I actually did. And yeah, I actually did. And then we start thinking about community development, like the Aquaria user group and stuff. So yeah. But so tell us about the Aquaria user group. That's still going, but uh, like, just tell us about the, the journey of Aquaria user group. Oh yeah, so Aquaria user group, I think it started in 2018 or 2017, I think late 2017. Yeah, late, late 2017. So basically the idea right now was because I found that many people are not using R and, but then we, I know for like my department, we're over, I think for the entire department, I think we're more than a thousand. So I know there's actually a need for this too, but most people aren't, like, aren't really aware of this um, technological R. And even if they had it, they, they don't really have access to people that actually knows it. So I came up with the Aquaria R user group. And it was fun, right? Because a lot of people was interested. We started having section within in classes. And it was nice teaching them, you know, the basics. Mm. And and it actually was great to only 2018, I think it was, yeah, 2018, like mid 2018, when I had to go for internship in somewhere in Kano, which is like like 11 hours drive from Akure. Yeah. So I think that actually where we actually, I, I think we actually had a little bit of issue because the people that I actually handed over wasn't as passionate as I was because of, I knew I can't actually be doing it from Kano because it's far and I had a full-time internship job um, at EOT Africa, which is one of the biggest health organizations in mm. Kano. And then they were looking at polio, how to eradicate polio from Nigeria. And I was part of the project. Um, and then for the seven months I was there, and when I got back February um, 2019, apparently everyone has gotten busy with something else. So trying to revamp it become a little bit um, difficult because at that time, you know, it's, a, it's my final year, you know, trying to like get ahead in school, trying to like define- Yeah, yeah, there's a lot on you. Yeah. So, so it becomes quite a lot, like it becomes quite a lot. And ever since then, I think the, the drive actually died down for the masses. But yeah, so that's that's what happened to every hour. And I think it was also around then uh, I got connected to Shell and they would start talking about Africa R. So the idea was now, how do we reach out to the continent, not just mm. Akure alone. So um, at that time, I was spending more time working with um, Shell 
in trying to like you know identify community leaders yeah so also that also affect my interaction with the aquarium community because i was thinking i could actually do more by looking at global like in the continent as regards to you know supporting yeah. one group and everything so yeah i think that that's actually, Shalmuth Karayuki from kenya is the one of the leads of africa are oh yes sure from kenya yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's good stuff. And so, uh, just actually tell me. So, like the um, the uh, um, there are quite a strong. There is quite a strong art community overall in Nigeria. Like I, I know that there's been like uh, there's an art user group in Abuja and Lagos, and I believe that there was an event in Ibadan once. So, if there is a regular conferences, meetups around Nigeria. Um, yes, there are um, local meetups by different chapters leaders in Nigeria. Yeah, they, there's one in Abuja, there's in Lagos, um, there is in Ibadan, and I, there is also one, um, I think it's in Ogun State. Um, I can't remember the state specific, but it just recently. Uh, there's one in Kano, interesting enough. I'm not sure about Kano now, but yeah, it's actually um, getting big in community. Good stuff. And so oh, you just actually mentioned their uh, GIS. I know, I believe you were quite involved in a, an organization that's more involved in map making. Just that's that might be interesting. Youth Mappers, is it? Oh, yes. Um, simultaneously, when I was working in improving myself in our, I was also got interested in open source community and GIS as well. So in my quest, looking, exploring open source technology I found about OpenStreetMap, um, which is a, a geospatial database of spatial data of the world. And it's a project that trying to map as much community as possible. And every every day people are making useful edits to better identify remote community in different areas, both in Africa or even in Europe that places place that is not yet mapped and stuff. So it's been really exciting. And in the process, there is Youth Mappers, which is a community that that tries to encourage, try to try to, yeah, I think it's mostly um, encourage and support students to participate in development in the open street map. So Youth Mappers cool. is more like, like like an organization around open street map. Yeah. So basically their own target is students from all over the world. And yeah, I've been part of the community since yeah, I think early 2017 until 20. Yeah, I'm still part of the community. Like I think I'm an alumni because I'm done with school. And I also assisted them with some regional ambassadorship, which is just to be able to mentor um university student like leaders to be able to like become more um, equipped with the technologies to better create maps on open street map yeah so that's cool and i'm very into uh, open street maps are very interesting um area i think there should be explored what r r and open street map could do in the future uh, just actually so in 2019 you were due to attend the use our international art conference in toulouse france first off actually just tell us about your journey in applying for it and then what happened when the conference was due to start oh okay so my president applying for it yeah yeah well it's um i think it was it was a good one right because um yeah, writing the application and everything, it's, it, it, took, it took a lot of time, you know, trying to get your thoughts together, trying to really know what you've done correctly, what you've done wrongly, and coming up with, like, trying to understand um, how attending the conference in the first place, you know, is going to better your, yeah, it's going to help you improve on, on how you helped community around you as well. And, but then it was also amazing because alongside I was working with Shell to be able to like make us use this opportunity to be in Toulouse to both see ourselves because we've not seen ourselves before. And it was gonna be really exciting. It's gonna be like um, myself and Shell from Kenya being there and you know, talking about you know, how we could take African art to the next stage yeah. and everything. And when I got the grant to, um, grant and scholarship to attend. It was really amazing because um, I was I was amazed and knowing that 
Shell would also be attending, became really, yeah. really amazing as well, right? So it was like, um, yeah, we're definitely going to do this. Like, we're going to be there. We're going to like see, spend some time together, if possible, delay our flight for like a day just to be able to like, you know, get to meet and then talk more about moving things forward. Yeah. And then the issue of the visa came, applied to the visa embassy. And fortunately, um, yeah, I didn't get it, which was quite uh, disappointing because um, I was actually looking forward to being at that yeah. conference. Because, um, the, this the is an issue that affects a lot of African researchers when they get invited to conferences that the, as much of the work they put in for their own research, they have to put in almost twice as much, if not more, to actually get the visa just to go and they have to travel around. So it's a big map, big, big process. And sometimes they don't even get a result. So is it that your like your you know your um experience like the, the, the to get the visa you had to was it like drive to Abuja or something like what was the um yeah it's uh, yeah sounds like hell. because um it's I, I had to go to Abuja um then but we also have to like make a schedule right so you you will find into a schedule a day that you have to be present um, and yeah the process it's really um. Yeah, it's really, yeah, I think I think the, the worst thing is not actually the process, is the fact that after you put in the work and uh, spending some time to like get there and get there on time and, you know, put in the application, you end up not getting the visa. I think that's actually the more, the more annoying thing, right? So, so yeah, it's, yeah. it's really a problem here. Yeah, yeah the, 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 uh, uh, unfortunately, it's, it's, uh, this is going to, uh, this has been going on for quite a few years and only f recently people are starting to take notice and realize how unfair it is. Uh, just actually with regards to the conference itself, let's uh, uh, look at that now. You actually did have a talk accepted and you were yes, due to get, get on stage and uh, give a talk. Just actually, what was the talk about? What was the topic of the talk? Your talk? Oh, um, well, I think it was more like... Um... The Africa Hour. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, we were supposed to talk about, you know, the the community, like what our plans are. Yeah. What we've done so far, what we hope to achieve in like a year or even two years time. Yeah. Some yeah. of our strategies and some, uh, most especially, you know, how we how we more than more than like how we actually really. We love everyone's support in order to be able to bring what we're doing in Africa um, into the light. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I was glad that um, the the user was able to find ways for us to be able to talk about uh, that particular concept because I, I've been able to show after the stop, people became more aware of what we're doing in, in Africa, uh, which which was great. Yeah, yeah. Just actually, just like yeah, paint a picture of the. Uh, pan African R community. I know that there's a lot of really strong R communities right across Africa. What's your sort of interpretation or your like uh, take on each one of them? Let's say like Kenya, South Africa, Senegal, the Francophone countries, like, you know, what's going on in each of those? Um, I think it's the same thing that's going on in all of them, which is they're trying to like, you know, train everyone on how, like on, on the usefulness of R and yeah. not just in, in academic, right? Even in the industry as well. Um, I think I, I for one, I'm actually really big in applying R in, in the industry, not necessarily um, in academics. And, and I think it's something, um, even organizations in, in Nigeria or even in Africa, just trying, to, they're starting to understand and embrace. And I, I want to believe it's because of our efforts, which would be really interesting because um, I mean, if you look at the start of people who, who we use um, R in the industry, it's low as compared to Python or other language. Yeah, it's, it's general purpose is um, object oriented. Um, I know, but I see few when it comes to data science and machine learning um r is actually really really good and it's really fast and more than ever it's getting more improved by a lot of developers even yeah. with shiny even with shiny for creating dashboards and stuff that's that's really been amazing 
So um, in in South Africa, yeah, they're, they're doing amazing, amazing, the yeah, amazing work with R. Like the organization I work with, we only use R as our stack. And yeah, some SQL for querying database, but mostly everyone in the industry programs in R. Those who don't actually learn how to program in R, which was really amazing because it's actually one one of the industry in in Africa that I know uses R so much. And and I was really lucky. Um, reaching out to them and starting working with them because it just helped me improve my my R interest. I'm not yeah. even aware that okay, you you've been spending some time in R and now you want to start using R to yeah. work with real world data to help businesses make informed decisions. In Kenya, um, I know Shell works with some organizations uh, and I and I know Lona Lona from I think she's from Uganda. She worked with policy. Yeah. And so I think people are starting to use R in too many ways in different um, in different settings, and I think that's that's great. And so I think in general we all actually share the same value. We're trying to like you know make make people understand that we are actually using R very well in, in different settings, and most of all we we actually. R is actually becoming, I mean, for those people that does not know about R, we're trying to like, you know, help them understand it better in, in various ways that we could, in various ways, even in um, in Abidjan. I know some of our colleagues in as part of African R, they, they actually were doing R courses in French, which is great because, you know, you, you're bridging the language, uh, the language gaps. And I think that's that's brilliant. Um, I just feel when we, when, when, it's a community like an Africa Arab comes in and every country is coming to like want to work for the same goal. It just become super big and super awesome because you, you, you're looking at different tribes and different experiences. And I think that's, um, that's huge. Good stuff. So just actually go, the, you've raised some interesting questions there actually. I just could sort of like go back to use R. On the day of your talk, you were uh, there were special arrangements made. I believe that you recorded it and that uh, you got assistance from John Harmon. Was it? Um. Yes. So tell us about that. Like, what what was the setup for the use our talk that you uh, that was given in uh, Toulouse? I was actually oh, yeah, asked. So... so it was a recording of you. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, so for that, um, um, in I think was it twenty eighteen or twenty nineteen? So we, myself, um, John Hammond, uh, and I think Thomas Mark, we became part of the Arrow for Data Science online community. I've been. Um, Jess was actually paranoid that for a while, and then she realized that it's time for her to move on to some other things and. I was in the community, and I knew how the community has been able to change my. My understanding because sometimes when I had issues, I put it on the platform and then found people to answer it and outside, uh, and outside, which was great. So, yeah, John, John Harmon was really like, it, it was really amazing because uh, we, we were able to, like, he actually was able to find a way for, for, for me to be part of that presentation, which I think was huge. And it was talking about, you know, the African like the African for data science community, um, which is a Slack channel of which most of us haven't met ourselves, but some do in conferences like the user or uh, the user. So, which uh, which was great. So basically I think the idea was just for, for, for us to tell people that, yeah, hey, dear, we, we are here. If you have any questions, be part of this group. Um, we, we're more than always happy to receive anyone from any part of the world. Uh, which is actually one of our greatest value because uh, mm. we don't discriminate or are they are for data science online community. Uh, it's it's actually everyone there is respectable and then we have a lot of people there, like a lot of big guys. It's a great community. resource. Yeah, it's a great resource. Just actually for anyone who wanted to join that, that, I believe that the main part of that is a Slack channel or for DS community dot slack dot com, something like that. Um, yeah, we have a web page. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm happy to share with you. We probably added some oh, can we put it in the description? Yeah. All right, cool. So it's for datascience.com, datasky.com. So uh, I'll do that. 
yeah, yeah, good stuff. Uh, just actually, you mentioned there that like, um, uh, sorry, just actually on, on, on uh, what happened there was I think John Harmon presented remotely to the audience. Uh, I believe that he was getting up at four in the morning to do the talk, uh, four in the morning at his local time. So, but it was a really great talk. It was really informative. I was actually in the audience for it, like so. Um, so just a, like a, something you mentioned there was uh, the, um, the the there's a lot of francophone countries in West Africa. So uh, whereas Nigeria is an anglophone, but you're surrounded by a lot of francophone countries. How is that the sort of uh, affect the dynamic of the R community in West Africa with two different main language groups? Um, good question because. Um... Honestly, I think so. For for a while, um, even part of the challenges we had in African art was even identifying the people from the francophone. Like up till now, we're still trying to identify the user group in Ghana, and the same thing applies to Togo and Benin Republic. These are actually the francophone countries that's close to Nigeria, um, and sometimes we. We want to feel that there's really a lot of gap because these people aren't, aren't using our, maybe maybe we're wrong, but from the social presence, like the only user group we saw is no longer active. And we, we saw that using the, the meetup and then we type kind of our user group. It's no longer active. We try to send emails to try to um, see if they are still, like, still active, but all to no avail, right? So, so yeah, it's, it's, um, let's say, I wouldn't say I understand what's going on there because um, I haven't seen much activities going on in, in, those, part of, in, in those part of West Africa. Okay. So I'm aware some stuff is going on in Nigeria, in Tanzania, in Kenya, but for Ghana, Togo, Abidjan, I, ben, Benin Republic, no, nah, I haven't seen much going on there. Okay, it's, 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 there's, there's still a lot, lot of work to do. Uh, just yeah. actually, um, with regard to uh, the COVID crisis, so uh, Africa was going very strong in 2019. And so, but what happened is, I believe that in early 2020, the COVID crisis hit. How has that affected, first off, like your work, uh, how Africa are, the art community, how has that affected the art community in Africa? Well, it actually really, really affected the, the community because um, we like weren't that comfortable with online online tools like using Zoom and, and the like, at least for some reasons, the issues with internet connectivity. So around that time, we we're actually relying on on-site training because we get these people to be there and then we get them to participate and then we also see what they're doing yeah but when we try doing online like even the people that showed interest um wasn't wasn't much and then even uh, the issues with internet connectivity and access to electricity so these and uh, many more was just like some injuries that we foresee and then considering the fact that um, every, every, everything has just started happening simultaneously, the risks become more high, people were scared, uh, people just want to like, you know, be with home with your family to see yeah. if these um, pandemic would just, you know, fit the way and, and the like. So it, it actually affected the, the anchor and, and the community. Yeah, no, that, that's understandable. How has it affected you personally? So uh, the COVID crisis? Well, good question. How did it affect me personally? Um, I don't think, oh yeah. So I actually have an habit of traveling. Um, so 2019, I was, like 2020, I wasn't able to travel. Uh, it was really annoying because um, I don't mean within Nigeria. I mean, outside Nigeria, I had planned to travel to South Africa for like um, a month. The plan was already um, in play. Um, I think I also wanted to travel to some other African country, you know, just to be able to see what's going on there and, you know, and then be able to do so, and then be able to meet people and connect with other people, right? Yeah. I wasn't able to do that, and that sucked a lot. I'm hoping I'll do that this year. But the fact that I was working remotely um, before I started, um, it was normal for me. 
and which means the only thing I just had to do was spend more time indoor. But the fact that I, was, I wasn't able to travel a lot, like out of the country and even traveling from Nigeria to Lagos was a no brainer because the cases in Lagos were way higher than I go like, I think 300% higher than what is going on in, in Akure. And I was like, yeah, you can't expect me to go there, right? So, so yeah, it, it actually affected in, in those ways. And then hearing that, you know, people are getting, um, yeah, getting sacked from work because you know the organization is no longer producing revenues and stuff. Yeah, yeah that that actually really sucked because some of my friends was hit in the process, right? So, but yeah, our, our firm survived the the crisis and and yeah, and then we're, we're still working, still moving. Good stuff. Uh, has there been uh, you know you mentioned there that uh, internet access and internet issues and reliable electricity is like a, a continuing problem in Africa that they've not really uh, that this is not properly developed yet. Would that be fair to say is that the internet access is something that a, a major practical challenge across Africa? Is that fair to say? Um, yes, in most. This is in Africa, yeah, yeah, it, it's fair to say. Because the same thing is going on in Kenya and I think Tanzania as well. From I think Ghana as well, some part of Ghana does really have constant light. Um, yeah, so yeah. yeah, you could actually generalize that most places in Africa don't really have adequate yeah. electricity. So uh, I, I think a lot of people use mobile data plans and they use their phones a lot, but I believe that's quite expensive, like just that sort of practical thing. Can you just tell us more about that? Um, yes, so I, for one, I spent um, around, like I spent a lot on internet connection because I need to always be connected at, at least all through the pandemic, you know. You know, even till now, I'm, I'm used to always be home, like mm. stream my movies online and likes. But then the issue right now is that what you end up doing is that you pay a lot for internet. Even though you pay for this internet, it's not reliable. Sometimes it's it's good, like let's say early in the morning between um, let's say one a.m. to like seven a.m. It's it's fast, it's good. When I mean fast, I mean like ten megabyte per second, which is crazy because I think in the Western country, I mean fast means like over hundred megabyte per second, right? So it's relatively fast for what we're trying to do. And when it, during the working hour, uh, it becomes slow. So sometimes you have issues with, um, can you hear me, lags, like maybe the person yeah. talks, and maybe later. I think the reason why this was really effective right now is a Saturday, and I think a lot of organizations are not really using the internet right now. So okay. I think that's the reason why uh, this this call could actually go very easy right now without no more interruption. And also, I'm actually subscribed to one of the most expensive data plans in Nigeria because um, people are not actually subscribing to NEET because it's expensive. And, and uh, as for, okay, as due to the fact that it's expensive, so a lot of people are not actually on this internet, like on, on, on the network, so which, which, makes it, which makes it a little bit faster because few people are on, on the network, but it's very, very expensive. So I think the trade-off is that probably spending way more money on internet, like, I mean, a lot of money. So sometimes when I tell people I, I use like practically Nigerian minimum wages on my internet every month, they're like, you, you're not serious, like you, you're kidding. Like, but then it's true because um, it's, it's very expensive. Trying to always be, um, trying to use reliable internet in Nigeria though, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's, which is, that's, which is, that's hopefully a problem that we sort of tackle, like people sort of be very vocal and sort of say that, you know, we need we need this improved very fast. And um, that's great. I think we'll leave it there. We've covered a lot of ground, actually. And uh, it's yeah, sort yeah. of, you know, I, I think it's a great talk. Just actually, what's your, if, if for the immediate future, with the, the last question, uh, for the immediate future, what's your goals as an R user? Let, let's say next two or three years. Oh, good question. Well, over time, I, I realized that uh, I think I think the community is one way to contribute to the our community and the our network and everything. But right now, I'm currently in the stage of of my career, or I'm trying to I'm starting to want to be part of like these people that create better tools for our community. 
like you know packages and trying to optimize software even probably contribute to the shiny the shiny tool by either you know working more making it more responsive by um, relying more with bootstraps or you know just just to be able to be part of the ecosystem that supports these tools um, in different ways, either by optimizing it or by creating better ways to connect R to different uh, tools and technologies or data sources as well, right? So that's actually one area that I was spending a lot of time, like even since last year on, you know, trying to become more like an R developer. And at the same time, it gives, it gives me this, um, this experience to better understand the iron ecosystem, not mm. just as a user, but also as a builder. And in the process, um, maybe with time, we finally get back on our feet as an Africa R and then start contributing yeah. more to the community. And not just as a user like them there, but as a very, very, um, as a strong contributor to the, to the packages or the tools that we will be using. And I think that would be very, very effective because you could always print out some of the uh, tools that you've been able to create for this community in order to be able to improve um, the community, um, not just as a as as not not just as as a case of the users that are using it, but as regards to how the tools communicate better uh, with uh, with programs and how people interact with the tools as well. So, yeah, in three years, um, I see myself more as a developer and also contributing to the community by um, speaking with people, trying to mentor them, and also trying to share my experience in, in conferences or in talks like these. Yeah, I'm always open to talks like this, yeah. Good stuff. Hopefully we'll be doing lots of uh, uh, talks, um, online talks in the immediate future to sort of galvanize and motivate everyone again. Dennis, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks so much, Kelvin. This was great. Yeah, it was actually. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. Bye bye.